I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed Podcast. I'm still down here at the Southern Lair. Um, we're still trying to find Zach. He's somewhere in America, Jay. <laughs> Zach is, he's, uh, he he's was like, a- hey, we, we did hear from his assistant that, you know, he was not going to be here today. So I said, we're, we're getting further removed from Zach when only, I can only hear from his assistant. I don't know where. The yeah, we've is. gone about a month and we haven't seen Zach. So, uh, <laughs> his contribution to this podcast was kind of like, uh, a Roman candle, you know, it came out and there was a few explosions and then you just look That's up right. and it was just silence. I'm just wondering so, if he quit preaching because I figured he was like me. He was using our discussion as his preaching fuel for his, you know, he's, he's rotating like I do. So maybe he's quit preaching and now he has no need for us anymore. I don't know. There we'll may see. be maybe time for an intervention now, a podcast <laughs> intervention. Right. Come back, Zach. We need a campaign. Come back, Zach. Come back from the dead. <laughs> we need some resurrection. Well, I'm hoping. Well, he gets a lot of grief from our listeners, so I hope one of our listeners hasn't sent him an ugly email. Maybe you scared him off. So those of you that love Zach, you need to start the Comeback Zach's uh, campaign. So I miss his insight because he's, he's got good stuff. He's, he's a smart guy. Or he might have just ran uh, he, he might have just ran out of uh, words that we had never <laughs> heard of, so he's busy studying <laughs> dictionaries. He may be reading the Scrabble Dictionary as we speak. I'm getting him that for Christmas, by the way, when that comes around. <laughs> That's I'm going to get him some thesaurus and a, and a – Yeah. Or maybe just a Scrabble game. <laughs> yeah, big words. So what's going on in your life? Oh, I got some breaking news. So, you know, what's funny is a couple of podcasts ago, I talked about uh, Hollywood being on strike, yawn. And uh, and then I talked about seeing that movie, The Sound of Freedom, which yep. I still encourage people to be a part of that. You'll, you'll, you'll thank me later, even though it's a difficult movie to watch. Well, you know, it's funny, Jay, since you since you did that and talked about that on here, uh, I've been noticing that, of course, I've seen a couple of interviews with Jim Caviezel, who's the actor that played this man. But then uh, Tim, I can't remember his last name, and it's the actual guy. I've seen him doing several interviews and podcasts. And so it's really like it's doing so well that there's a lot, a ton of media, you know, especially well, Christian yeah. and. You know, right? We well, this story just needs to be told, and there's enough passages about children and trying to protect them in the Bible, and them even. We're talking about Jesus going around preaching the kingdom, and part of that message was introducing that the greatest was children and protecting yeah. them and having their attitude, and so e- even that verse in Matthew 18 was quoted in that movie about. Not causing the millstone. children. Yep, it, it, it was. Yep. But so anyway, what I was going to say, though, is I did something this week because we've done a lot of podcasts our time in the last couple of weeks. So I'm not sure when this will be released because I got a lot of travel time with the treasure hunting show coming up. So we're we're getting ahead. But right. I actually saw my second movie in less than a week last night which Whoa. is not something i've done in at least a decade i mean where i actually got in a vehicle with my wife and drove to the theater and what's funny about last night we went and saw mission impossible which i had left a cliffhanger about that and i have to i have to go ahead and confess something because the biggest <laughs> problem i had with with that title of the movie, as I said, it was built on a lie because they say it's Mission Impossible. They play the music, dun, 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 dun. (laughs) And then they go out and they do it. So I have to confess that I was wrong because they actually didn't complete the mission. (laughs) Because it's a part one. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Well, I didn't know it was a part one. Spoiler spoiler alert. (laughs) So then I thought, okay, so actually, actually the it title, was Mission Impossible. It fit because at this point, now the only you know bad thing is, is you realize at some point, if they complete this mission, then it would not have been impossible. 
So it's a possibility that it's still alive, but at this technical aspect of where I'm at in seeing the movie, it is a. But you know that Jace, that they, they've got a they've got a strike going on uh, again. It may have already been settled by the time this releases, but at the moment there's a strike going on. So if they never get back to film it again, if because some of them are gloom and doom, the industry's over. There's gonna be no more movies. Blah blah blah. The AI is taking over. So if that happens, it could literally be Mission Impossible. What if it ended? It could be with that movie. Yeah. But I'm gonna give you several. I'm going to give you several spoiler alerts, and uh, it's not what you think. But the whole the whole idea I had from using that movie as an illustration is to bring out your know, God being the God of impossible. We view impossible. I mean, I thought about just our last podcast when we talked about, remember the guy having doubts, and he was like, help me with my unbelief, and Jesus responded, you know, with all things, God is possible. Yeah. Right. So nothing is impossible. And it, there's several verses that we read the Hebrews 11 aspect. You can't please God without faith. But what I did notice is this movie had several references to biblical things. Uh, you know, the key thing of the movie, which I won't tell you what it is because I don't want to ruin the movie for you, is in the shape of what? A cross. And they actually, mm. some character made a line and called it the crucifix. I forgot the exact phrase because I was at the theater, so I couldn't re rewind it, but I would have if I'd have watched it at home. <laughs> they called it a crucifix something. And uh, I thought, interesting. And then there was also, uh, there were several quotes of, as it is written, there was an entity, an unknown, powerful entity that was able to be everywhere at one time, mm. yet not revealing anything that humans could wrap their head around. I'm like, yeah, well, where, where are they getting all these ideas? You, you will notice it now that I'm bringing it up. Over mm -hmm. and over, there's this, this spiritual war, and literally spiritual war. That's the enemy, the the ultimate entity, which in this case was on the dark side. But it was still using all the concepts of what this Bible reveals to make a movie. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because that's always the most interesting things in life. What the Bible discusses, it is the most interesting thing and questions that human beings have in life. That's why movies that do well take those same issues and they may manipulate the concepts, but they make yeah. it part of the movie. It, it was incredible. No, but you bring up a great point because let's face it, in any of these franchise movies like James Bond or in this case, Mission Impossible, any of these ones where you kind of have like, you know, this is these are the good guys and, and we're always having the bad guys. The, you re really remember the film by how sinister the bad guy was. Like, yeah. you know, the takedown had to be really impressive. And it really does go back then to the ultimate enemy that we face. It's like in this series, in the Mission Impossible series, which I've enjoyed. But, you know, for guys my age, because you don't even probably know this, Jace, but Mission Impossible was a television show back in the 60s and early 70s. You, do you remember it, Dad? Yeah. So yeah. so the guy, the main guy, uh, Hunt, in the television show – was actually Matt Dillon, dad's favorite Western, James Arness. It was his brother. Uh, I think his name was Peter Arness, was the main guy in Mission Impossible on the television show. But I loved it even way back then. So I think that's where what founded the series. But up, my point was on the third movie, it's always been my favorite in the series. And the reason why I think is because the – the bad guy, which was the Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think is his name. And he's not a very scary dude. Most time he's kind of a weird, goofy actor. I think he's passed away now. So I don't want to talk bad about him, but he, he, he was so sinister because he was very realistic in that movie. And like they, you know, he had, uh, Ethan Hunt had got married secretly and then they, they kidnapped the wife in this, in the third one. 
And and so her life is on the line and this guy has her. And so it was like a race against time. You know, it really was. a. It turned out to be Mission Possible. But it was I think what made it so memorable to me is the enemy. So to your point, I think that's what makes a movie great, but especially in that series as well. Well, my point is they even though true Christianity is frowned upon for the most part from the Hollywood they just can't make great movies without spiritual concepts and, uh, you know, or a manipulation of those life after death. I mean, it was called mission impossible dead reckoning. Well, what does that sound like? <laughs> There's a reckoning. Yeah. What are we going to the dead reckoning? It, it, it sounds like something you would read in the Bible. Yeah. Right or wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is what we're talking about. So, yeah, what the So I got to know one was, thing, Jace. Uh, you can tell yeah. tell me this. Was the is there a scene in the movie cuz I've never seen a movie that Tom Cruise was in where he's running as fast as he possibly can. Is there multiple is, he, oh, there's there's multiple <laughs> with the hands coming up. Yeah. And look, you would hear me thinking thinking I thought the movie was great. It was just meh to me. I Missy loved it. She's she she's into that more than me. You know, I get more at, a kick out of finding their spiritual principles that they're trying to convey on making yeah. it the movie matter. But now look, yeah. the special effects and stunts and all that stuff was, you're not going to find anything better in the movie world. I mean, all that was off the charts. Good, but just overall, you know, it was just, eh. what I found funny is that most of the people in the theater, were people that I knew. It was like we all planned <laughs> to go see the movie. I mean, I, I really felt like after it was over, someone could have led worship, and, and we could have had a worship <laughs> service. So <laughs> the row in front of me was Sadie <laughs> and her husband, uh, John Luke, and his wife. And right behind me was uh, Curly Don Foster, who, you know, he worked with us. Oh, yeah. Down here on the crawfish farms and all that. I mean, he's been a, how long have we known him? I mean. Oh, man, and, 40 uh, years. And right behind them, Phil, was the Greek. When Phil checks the Greek when he's studying his Bible, and it's not what yeah. you think. It's not the Greek lexicon. There's a member of our <laughs> church who is from Greece. And, yeah. uh, and her and her husband were in the row behind and a lot of Mia's friends were on another row. I mean, there was so many, and there weren't a lot of people in the theater. There were so very pretty few much people. It, yeah. That we didn't people know. You knew. The only negative thing was the, there was a couple, two seats down from my wife that we didn't know. And, uh, about 30 minutes into the movie, you know, Missy leaned over and she's like, this guy's driving me crazy. And it was, Something that I wasn't noticing, but once she drew attention to it, I mean, there was a guy, he had two bags, he had a bag of popcorn and he had a bag of something else. And it was like, if you were trying to make the most noise possible, <laughs> <laughs> like every popcorn kernel just, <laughs> and I, so when I, no then I noticed it, well, I'm like, well, thank you for drawing attention to that because now I can't even hear the movie. <laughs> and it went on and the popcorn bags are so big it would take an entire movie to get to the bottom of it well it it became so noticeable because the, the rattling of the bag and i'd look down at him and he would be looking in the bag and like shaking the bag and it was like he was looking for something in there that was not popcorn and i thought and maybe it was the current we we found we figured out that he was looking for the little kernels that didn't pop but when he found one, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard, because then it was like he just enjoyed the crack. <laughs> it could have been. Chase, uh, hang on, let's take a break. We do quite a bit of travel. Jace has been doing uh, probably more than most recently, because you're also filming a television show that's all across the fruited plains. What's the one thing you... Uh, Miss the most when you're away from your 
uh, Hacienda, your well, casa. Actually, tomorrow I'm leaving to the great northwest mm. in the mountainous regions, and I'm going to be sleeping on the ground <laughs> for a week. <laughs> One week. So obviously... I miss my Helix bed. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that because uh, we're here to talk a little bit about Helix uh, sleep, uh, which is, and we all sleep on the Helix mattresses. They're fantastic. Uh, they come with a 10 or 15 year warranty, uh, depending on the model. They've been awarded the number one mattress uh, by several magazines. And right now they're offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our unashamed listeners, which is pretty awesome. And so what you're going to do is go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. Uh, you're going to take a quiz, and they're going to match you to uh, the mattress that fits you best. And so that's really great. Um, and then you're going to get your mattress, and uh, you're going to be able to try it, and you're going to love it. So give them a shot. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders, two free pillows, helixsleep.com slash unashamed. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long with Helix Better Sleep starts now. Jason, could have been, so I saw this guy doing this one time. Maybe, I don't know, you may not notice it, but there's there's apparently, there's a thing about people buying chocolate. They usually bring it in, them, they, they smuggle it in because they don't want to pay the high prices for the M&M. But they put chocolate candies like M&Ms in their popcorn. Well, Al, we so we have this. when we buy the popcorn, we we buy the little crunch, the chocolate crunch. That that's like has to be with. Oh, so y'all so, do that? Oh, you put I it do. In your I popcorn. eat the popcorn yeah. and then eat two or three. It's really. The I was wondering maybe if this guy was doing that and he was looking for the chocolate. I think he had a nuggets. system. Uh, and but finally, when the action <laughs> scenes would hit, they were so loud that you couldn't hear it. So then you would forget about it. But then there were a lot of few moments in the movie that were just dead silence. And all you could hear was just that hush, hush, hush. <laughs> so it led to such an interesting conversation on the way home, which really wasn't pleasant. Because I was like, what was that? What was this girl thinking? I mean, and Missy's like, you're going too far down the rabbit hole. But I'm like, but she has made a decision <laughs> to, this is who she's with. And you got, you know, you dance with the person who brought you. And she was like, well, what she should have said is stop doing that, because that's what I would have done. Because I was like, what if I would have been doing that? She said, I would have leaned over and said, hey, do this more quietly. And uh, <laughs> so then really I, I was just like, she didn't seem phased about it, but uh, I don't know. It was an interesting conversation. But overall, it was middle of the road. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's worth going just to notice the spiritual parallels and overall it's a it's a pretty clean movie for hollywood i yeah. mean there might have been a, yeah and those are pretty good a handful of bad words but very few the last movie i went to down here we had and it wasn't that many in the theater either in fact they'd already put it in the small one but there were a couple of ladies like two rows above us and one of them was like mom she's a commentator which that you know, so I just but the, unlike you, Jay's like the when it started, and I thought, okay, we're gonna see if she stops because she's commenting all the way through the things leading up to like the previews. And I told Lisa, I said, if she keeps this going during the movie, we're moving because I'm not gonna sit here and listen to what she thinks about the movie for the whole movie. And sure enough, she started in, so we just got up and moved down about four rows. I just you know I, it, that's another thing; it's just so annoying, like you're talking loud enough, it's quiet in there. So if you're talking during the movie, especially about the movie, you're yeah. ruining it for everybody else. So don't, do, please just, don't do that. It's our society, though. I mean, there was, you know, the when we saw The Sound of Freedom, I saw a guy get removed from the movie theater, or like right when the movie started. And uh, and he wasn't happy about it. But, you know, now the way it is, when you order seats, you can order it. Well, they give you assigned seats. You go sit in your seat. And he was yeah. sitting in someone else's seat. And it was a big burly guy, looked like a truck driver, you know, just had a big cowboy hat on. And so this woman came and they're like, I mean, I didn't see how it, I'm putting the pieces together. Because when it got loud, everyone noticed, you know. And so yeah. they basically, somebody came up and said, 
this is not your seat. And uh, he's he just disagreed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, so there's now arguments within the movie house where people are arguing about where they sit. Well, the people who run the movie house gave that seat to someone else. They're, the person who had the seat, they ordered a seat. They're standing behind. They're like, that's my seat. And they had the visual proof, a ticket. And this guy said, that's the craziest thing. This is, a, this is America. He went America. It's a free country. I'll pay my money. <laughs> I want to sit anywhere I want to. That was the argument. Yeah. And so. But they changed I wasn't, the policy. Well, they changed the policy, but in his defense, I wasn't aware the policy had been changed either. You know, Missy orders the tickets. I show up, and I'm like, where are we going to sit? And she's leading the way because we have a signed seat, kind of like an airplane, you know. Mm. So even though I respected the guy saying it's a free country and I love America, he was dead wrong. You're in <laughs> someone else's seat. So get up and show some humility, but it just didn't end well. And he left the movie. He left the the I mean, last time I saw, he was hollering, headed out the door. They everybody <laughs> that worked for the theater was because you know nobody could take this guy, so they just went in mass once he got ugly. There was you know all available personnel come because the next call was going to be to the police. Were there any empty seats that were there? There was plenty of them. <laughs> yeah. He, oh, he was the problem. You know, he just wanted to sit there and he didn't understand that someone else had the seat and there was, but it made me think of all these, when you think about spiritual problems and the worst thing you battle in life, it goes back to Luke six, when someone's being prideful and, and they're hard hearted or calloused or they've made up their mind that that is the place you don't want to be in life because he wasn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't listen. Right. They were trying to explain it to him, but he was so angry in the moment and prideful that he would not listen. The truth would have set but, him free, but he wouldn't listen to the truth. Yep. So dad, I don't know if you remember this or not. So, uh, the, and I remember the year. And the only reason I remember the year is because Lisa was pregnant with Anna and she's 37. So it was 37 years ago. So it'd been 1985 back when you used to go to the movies, uh, you and mom and Lisa and I went to a movie together and the movie was, I still remember the movie. It was Delta Force with Chuck Norris and Lee Marvin. I, oh, I was there. <laughs> I remember what happened. Yes. Were you there too, Jase? Oh, I, didn't I realize was there. You were there too. Oh, no. It was one of the most frightening moments. Uh, uh, my head was on a swivel. And you can explain <laughs> the story and you'll know why. It was actually so two for, movies simultaneously <laughs> with right. action, but one of them was on the screen and one of them was behind us. So what was funny was, is that y'all didn't sit, Lisa and I, for some reason, didn't sit with y'all. Y'all sat down lower than us. So behind y'all, but in front of us, we were literally a row behind the action uh, in yeah. the in the theater. And so, it's, you know, Delta Force, they're going in, they're trying to get our people out of Iraq, I mean, it, or wherever they were at the time, Iran. And there's the shoot em up and Lee Marvin and Chuck Norris. And well, something was said, apparently by a couple of guys coming into the theater. There was a, there was something that had happened previous to what then happened because I, I don't know what started it, but about right at the end of the movie, this guy comes up and there's a guy sitting right in front of us. And he, he was kind of mouthy. I, I'll say that. Cause you just kind of hear him say stuff. He just slugs him right in the jaw, but it's kind of a sucker punch. Cause the guy didn't see it coming. It was kind of, yeah. he just roundhoused him in the face and all of a sudden, then a fight breaks out. And it's literally in the row right in front of us, but it's a few rows behind you guys. And so I'm mm -hmm. trying to get Lisa. She's big, pregnant, like her belly's poking out. And so I'm trying to get her back. And so we're literally crawling over seats because we got a big fight that broke out right in front yeah. of us. And the girlfriends no, are remember. fighting. The, yeah. the guys so are we fighting. were watching the movie. And at some point, we stood up because it was a fight. I mean, meat. Oh, it was it was on. people hollering because like, then their wives or whatever or girlfriends yeah. were screaming. And I remember looking at the movie because I wanted to see how it ended. But I looked back there <laughs> and eventually I went to the actual <laughs> physical real fight. It was way better uh, watching. <laughs> 
than what was on that movie screen because it, right. it was just a fracas. And there's nothing that you could say, well, how come you couldn't do anything? I couldn't do it. We were trapped. I couldn't even. Did ever, anybody out. ever find out the reason they did this? I don't. I mean, Al was speculating. I thought. Yeah, I was my, speculating. I thought it was the same thing I was describing at the first of this. I figured that guy had been so rude during the movie that somebody just had enough. But Al may be right. There might, there might. Have I think been something, something happened said. prior to them coming in. There seemed like there was some bad blood already. But there's definitely the guy. Just from his attitude and me listening to some of the things he said, I thought, okay, well, this is what happened. See, he he crossed the wrong guy. But it, you know, I just remember something you said down after it was over. I was telling y'all about because y'all were like, "What happened?" It was right in front of y'all. <laughs> And dad said, there was fighting in front of us and fight behind us. He said, I've never seen anything like <laughs> you were just well, like mesmerized. I always thought I said, I always thought when I explained that and told that story, because I've told it many times, too, is I said, I got two words for you, Chuck Norris, you know, because he became <laughs> such a phenomenon with people in, in a playful way with memes and, and all these That's things right. about who he is. And I mean, That's it's right. like he just inspires you to do crazy things. And sometimes they're stupid. Yeah. But uh, so, I, so when I met him, Jace, I told him that story, a brief version, because I didn't have long to talk to him. But I told him, I said, Chuck, we were watching one of your movies one time. So you remember Delta Force? He said, oh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. I said, well, in the theater, a big fight broke out. I said, and we attributed it to you, <laughs> to, to your prowess, that e you're so yeah. bad that even people fight in the theater when you're on the screen. So Yeah, that exactly. That's perfect. Jay, you're fixing to be back on some airplanes coming up. Um, got a little travel going. That means you need some really good earbuds that are that are cranking out some really good worship music. Is that is that what helps yeah. you get in the? And it drowns out all the announcements that you hear on an airplane <laughs> every right. time you fly that I could recite. That's right exactly now. right because you know all that stuff. So whether you're just uh, going on vacation, uh, where whatever your travel plans are for you going forward, uh, we want to tell you about Raycon, uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, cause they really make a great product, uh, their earbud functions, they, they, they're tap. So they go back and forth. You've got three customizable sound profiles, uh, noise isolation, awareness mode. They have a 32 hour battery life, uh, including eight hours of playtime. Uh, so that's really good. Especially if you got that long flight coming up, they have a uh, custom gel tips, uh, which are the most comfortable in ear fit. Uh, they start at half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. Uh, they also have a 30-day happiness guarantee, Dad, which is mm. always good. Uh, so you really c can't lose. I will warn you about one thing about them. Your kids and your grandkids will try to take them from you because this happens to me all the time. Create your own soundtrack with Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N. Uh, right now, uh, Unashamed listeners get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash unashamed. That's B-U-Y raycon.com slash unashamed to save 15% on your Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash unashamed. We're in Luke 9, and uh, I do have a, I'm going to jump ahead because I thought about that when I saw that movie and then I studied for this podcast after the movie, which may not have been a good idea. I probably should have done that in <laughs> reverse, you know, but, uh, cause then everything becomes a movie, you know, cause, cause really yeah. the greatest movie ever constructed, the greatest story is in this Bible. Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, you could, you could make movies for the rest of your life, just about things that, you know, especially from the Old Testament that are like, wow. And one of the things, one of the stories I read last night, I, I guess I had forgotten Second Kings 1, or I, maybe I never read it, you know, in an intentional way. But uh, I was like, you talking about a movie. But, and I'll tell you how this came about, because, you know, we're at a point in Luke, and I, I don't know if you agree with this, but I read this somewhere, and now that I've, kind of read backwards and forwards we're in luke chapter 9 but it seems like to me that luke's 
investigative account from a doctor's perspective and just trying to get the facts out there, you know, starting from Luke 1, 1 through 4, you know, he, he, he based this on eyewitnesses and, and ran a careful investigation of everything that had happened. It seems like Luke 1 through 8, the first eight chapters, or eight and a half, I mean, when you get to nine, it's like the pinnacle of who Jesus is. Yep. Yep. Who he claims to be, you know, yes, how he got here, the virgin birth, but he is claiming to be the son of God. And, and it it, it kind of hits the pinnacle in the where we're at today, which is in the middle of nine, which is Peter's famous confession of Christ. So just to prove my point, when you read where we're at in 9.18, this is, and, and you just remember, this is right on the heels of him sending out the 12 and Feed the feeding 5, the 5,000. And we went through this whole podcast about here's a revolution, but it's not what you think. It, it's done by people who seem to be inadequate. And this seems to be based on the fact of you humbling yourself and, and losing your life to find God's power from that humble state because act, in actuality that's is going to be Jesus's road to showing everyone he's the king of kings by actually becoming weak and humbling himself and being beaten, persecuted and all the way to a cross and then triumph and it's kind of a coming two back from the head. they they present the the whatever you the the size, um, the greatness, the, the the scariest when it comes to dying, death. Yeah. Death. You have death right here, but in this instance, death means life. All right. Well, I'm, we're going to get to that in the next paragraph about the transfiguration. Cause I mean, I that's think, pretty weird. You look at some, yeah. something, uh, life and death, you say, well, this, this this involved both of them. Well, right. And, and but without to, to the death, your point, there, there would be no life, and you're like, hmm. Well, to your point, you know, I, I brought up that word. I don't know if you remember this, which I was going to save this for the transfiguration, but we're here now. You remember how when we were studying in Second Peter 1, and Peter referenced, because he was at the end of his life on earth, and he referenced what was fixing to happen to him with the Greek word exodus, which was, it said departure. And I made a yeah, point that day, yeah, months ago in, in that podcast, that there's only three places that word is used, the Greek word. And one of them, which is in Second Peter 1, is also used in the transfiguration in Luke 9, when it says uh, Jesus was standing there with Moses and Elijah, and in verse 91, it said they they had a conversation about his departure, Jesus' departure, which is Exodus. that same word, Exodus. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I made the point back then that the term Exodus and this Greek word it has a has a double meaning. Like when you define it and you, you go look into the do your own investigation and you'll see that what I'm saying is true. When you think of an Exodus and you go back to Exodus, the book, it was a liberating. You, you're going from one place to another. You know, our Greek, I mean, our English words, we have trouble putting that Greek word into English. So they just have departure. Well, you think, well, it's a one-way street. No, departure and exodus, that's a two-way street. You're being liberated from something to something. And so yeah. when you look at death like that and you experience what they're discussing here, I do think it is in the context of them discussing the liberation from death itself. Mm-hmm. The, it, it's an arrival to really what the kingdom is all about. You're, you're going from being in bondage to royalty. 
that that him going out and declaring what the kingdom represents really culminates in the middle of Luke 9 because you have a confession by Peter and then you have this instance that is a preview of the death and the arrival of people that are a part of this kingdom. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because there's a conversation happening with a guy on the earth with two people that have been dead or missing for hundreds of years. Now, the reason I said are missing, because both of those guys, Moses and Elijah, had strange circumstances revolving around their deaths. One of them, Elijah, right. he didn't die. He just, they last time somebody saw him, he was headed out of space without a spaceship. Yeah. That was the story. With Moses, remember there was a big argument that developed in the spiritual world between the evil one and and other you know good angels about where Moses was buried because when you go back and read the Exodus account, it says that God buried him. Yeah. And and well the evil one who we know from Hebrews two had always that was his weapon. He was a murderer from the beginning, it's but also like a two pronged approach and one evil wants to claim the body and then good wins. <laughs> well, I think the evil evil one's being a murderer though. He he's like if you cause it's like John the Baptist, if you're a threat, well he'd just kill you. And then he's got proof of that. But there's all these rumors about, is there possible for him to come back from the dead? So, Zach, um, you used to work in campus ministry when you were here. Um, Like all of us, I think you've always had a a good ability to work uh, with young people, especially young men. All of us have tried to impact them. I think that's kind of even led to our podcast and its success. Um, What would you say, based on your experiences, that the uh, scourge of pornography uh, has done to to young men in particular, but young people in terms of how it's affected their spiritual walk. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, uh, it was probably the number one issue that we dealt with in college ministry with both men and, and uh, women, uh, young girls and young boys, average, their average age. I, I mean, these, these kids are average age exposures like, six, seven years old is crazy. I mean, it was insane. Yeah. We, yeah. To, I, I can't overestimate the impact, the negative impact that, that pornography is having on our culture right now. And you and I have had many discussions about it. Uh, we've read a lot of just secular pieces, even that have talked about yeah. how bad pornography has been on our culture and society. Uh, so we've got a great partner, uh, for the Unashamed Podcast, uh, a company we love, Covenant Eyes. They've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I still remember them back from my Promise Keepers days. And uh, yeah. and they really just help bring accountability uh, to all of your devices, your computers, phones, everything. Uh, definitely check these guys out for yourself or also maybe for your kids, someone in your family you love because it's time to start getting some help. Sign up for a free 30 days of Covenant Eyes today when you go to CovenantEyes.com and enter the promo code Phil. So that's uh, a free 30 days. Check them out, covenanteyes.com. Use the promo code Phil uh, and uh, begin to get some healing today. No, but you're exactly right. There were suspicious, whether they died or not, because some people that maybe live there say, oh, well, they just, yeah, they're dead. But they didn't die and weren't buried the normal way from anybody else. And then it is ironic that they show up here in this sort of kingdom picture of glorification, which is what it is, you know, which is powerful. Well, even Herod, who we went through that whole podcast, he was obviously not a believer, but he was thinking, is this John the Baptist come back from the dead? Now, granted it was from a guilty conscience and, but there was something about him, his character that he liked and he feared him it was it was working on him to think, what if he is from God? And so that's how these stories get developed, because even him, he didn't even believe in the resurrection or God. And he's thinking, is this possibly, is Jesus possibly John the Baptist coming back from the dead? It looks like the Sermon on the Mount, that, that someone a higher up than, than anybody else wrote down 
in kind of picture form up on top of this mountain. And here's some characters coming out of the Old Testament that have not been seen. And and the camera people are saying, "Get a shot! Of, get this! Get this!" Yeah, well, you'd have wanted to, you'd have wanted to get this. Yeah. So, yeah. So back to where we were. So, so it's a picture. Yeah. So in Luke nine, which is what I was going to say, I think the first eight and a half chapters are revealing. I mean, the point is Jesus as the Son of God. This this is the King is here. He's sharing about the kingdom. But it the plan hasn't been completely finished here. He That's he's right. just preparing. So they're going around saying repent because the Son of God is here. And then it seems to the next nine chapters, you know, Luke nine through eighteen, it's more the emphasis on what does this mean then that you know as as people follow him, you know, he gives them this ability to go out. Then the costs come up of following Jesus and the results. I mean, you know, that's just my opinion on, on me reading Luke one through eight eighteen. I mean, Jesus says the son of God is the theme, but it's Matthew, seemed- Mark and Luke cover it. I mean, very carefully. John softens up a little bit on the death of Jesus. The other ones. Well, Matthew- John just, John just picks it up later. He he doesn't do yeah, yeah. he doesn't do what the other three does to give the whole narrative. He just that's picks right. it up at the end. That, that's right. And, but but so Jace, you're right. And I think another marker that you're on to it is that you notice as we get to this point in Luke's narrative that he's putting the disciples to the test. You know, first he sends them out, you know, on their own because this is all like they're going to be doing. The, you know, f- from our perspective. You know, it seems like a lot of time, but when we're Jesus in real time, he's about to go to Jerusalem. He's yeah. fixing to be on his way in the in the later in this chapter. So it's happening in real time. So he's got to get yeah. these guys ready for what's coming. And then you add this lead in question. Who who do you say that I am? That's another test, I think, in terms of their development. So I think you're right. I think he's basically now he's saying we're this thing is fixing to get serious. Yep. In these next yeah. few chapters, and it is. And it is awesome because it gives you some insight later on, 2,000 years later, as believers, on how this works, how how we can follow him. What are the implications? I, I do think it is windows of how the disciples struggle, and then we see the same thing. I wanted to just point out, kind of going back to our movie movie theme on on where the state of my mind was last night. So when I read this, where Peter's confession is in Luke 8, 18, it says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? So they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He said, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God or the Messiah of God. Anointed, yeah. Then. Yeah. And so before we continue, though, I think just looking at this from the overview of like what I said from the first eight and a half chapters, the next eight and a half through, you know, all the way to 18. Yep. yep. Well, then you have the transfiguration. Well, one of, one of the, this question that Jesus, you know, asked you know, their reply when they said, who do the crowd say I am? Well, they brought up, like we said with Herod, that, well, this may be John the Baptist come back or, or you know, Elijah comes up. And you see that in the transfiguration, I think part of that story, which we'll get into in depth, but it's like a singling out of here's, here's two great prophets, right? Moses and Elijah. And then they leave. And when you look at the details of the story, as they're as they're going away, you know, then the disciples kind of kind of come to and there's just Jesus there and he's radiating. (laughs) And in that moment, it's really an answer to that question. And that answer on the crowd say, oh, it's just is he just another prophet? Just think about it. That's why I said this is the 
culminating moment, the transfiguration. Of course, you know, he also predicts his death, burial, and resurrection in between here. That's the part I'm skipping. But I'm saying, when you look at the picture, to your point, Phil, he's saying, no, this is not just a prophet. <laughs> he, he is illuminating, radiating glory and power. This is yeah. bigger than just another prophet. This is so, this is almost scary, right? For Peter and them, because they're like. Right, but I just wanted to make a point that I want to go to the end and show you that the disciples were really having difficulty wrapping their heads around it, and the reason I can prove that to you, because you would think that transfiguration would have been enough for them to say, hey, right, we're never following, but it just didn't. They still went back to this default setting on he's just another prophet. Now, I don't know what they thought. They were sleepy, it says, and... Maybe they thought it was a dream or they couldn't wrap their head around it. But you remember Peter was talking nonsense because I want to show you an illustration in 51. Hang on, Jace. Before you read that, let's take our last break. Of chapter 9 and 51, and we'll get to it, but I just want to show you that this obscure paragraph, which I think leads up to what I was talking about, would make a great movie from second kings one but it says as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven jesus resolutely set out for jerusalem to your point now that's why i wanted to read this Th yep. this was the moment that that this becomes real he predicts the gospel it, peter declares him as the son of god the transfiguration happens which i believe was a preparation for jesus to embrace the other side, the arrival part of death. Because why are yep. you having a meeting with two guys that have already gone through this? Well, that yep. would help you as a man now, as God as in human form say, okay, because this is a rough road even for Jesus. I mean, we, we see him crying out at the end. So I yep. think that's why this happened. It, it, yep. He's looking at two people who have arrived in view of death, and he had a conversation yep. with them. I'd feel a lot better about my death if I talked to two people that had already died right yeah. before it happened. Yeah. So don't discount that. So it says that in 51, then 52, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Now watch what happens. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? <laughs> <laughs> Sons of thunder. <laughs> Whoa. Re record scratch question. <laughs> Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they yeah. went to another village. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up. If you go back to where we started in verse 18 when he said, Who the crowd say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. The transfiguration happens, the prediction of the gospel. And then you see James and John didn't get it because now why would you, if, if Jesus is transfigured and he's the son of God, where in this, where in this rational thinking are you guessing that Jesus needs your permission for, to call down fireballs from heaven? Wouldn't that be his call, really? If he is the son of God, wouldn't he uh, be the fireball thrower? expert you know if that was but here's my point you say where did they get that from they get it because they had doubts and maybe he was in the spirit of elijah because i went and read i said is there anywhere i mean my first thought was sodom and gomorrah fireballs came down from heaven but also in second kings one there's a story in the bible that would be a fantastic movie missy didn't agree she's like we well, can never make that you know, it wasn't, I told her my idea and she didn't agree, but second Kings one and, and I'll, you, you can read the story if, if you're listening, cause it's the whole first chapter and you kind of, when you get to the end, I had to go back and read it like a couple times just to think I was looking at it from like, how would I make this a movie? <laughs> but it basically you had your production goes on. Had a yeah. I had, I had the, I had the, production hat on but i wanted to just give you a little sampling of it so in verse 
3, an angel of the Lord uh, said to Elijah, go up and meet the messengers. Uh, no, I, 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 oh, I have to read the first two verses. Okay. So go to verse 1. Uh, After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Isaiah had fallen through the lattice of the upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So this is the this is an opening scene. We got a king that fell through the roof and he injured himself. So he sent the messenger saying, go and consult Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. So here's where this thing starts. Well, the problem is Elijah is here and he's a prophet of God, obviously. And he's dressed, with, which what I thought was funny, one of these verses in here, it says he was dressed in fur and had a leather belt, a lot like John the Baptist. Verse 8. And yeah. so, yeah, in verse 8, okay. So this king doesn't consult God first. He goes out to a false god and tries to, because he's injured and he, he wants to know if he's going to be okay. So he's trying to consult a medium, a, a prophet, a godlike spirit. Well, that doesn't work. And so Elijah gets involved by, you know, they saw him on the road as they're going to this false god. And they, and Elijah says, look, he's not going to make it. He gonna die. He's going to die in that bed. So they go back and report this. And th- so he's obviously offended. He, so he wants to talk to Elijah more about it. So he sent 50 soldiers and a captain up on the mountain to talk to this guy wearing a fur. But you got to remember, he's a prophet of God. And so Elijah comes out of his little cave there and says, look, if I, if God is my God and I'm a prophet of God, may he send fireballs from heaven. And guess what happened? <laughs> fireballs Fireball. from heaven. <laughs> 51 casualties from fireballs. So this old boy who, who's in the bed hurt, well, he sends 50 more. Another captain. And look, they strongly, they, they, who you think you are? Well, guess what? Same message. Fire, if I'm, if God is on my side, here come, they were threatening him every time. Fireballs. Now we were up to 102 casualties of war. <laughs> this guy, all the king, who is showing no remorse for sending these guys into their death, sends 50 more. Another captain. He's going to run out of men. He's going to run out of men at some point, but he doesn't <laughs> care because what do natural earthly kings do? They think only of themselves. It's yeah. all about their power. But this third captain was smart. He went up there to Elijah's cave and he hit his knees and said, have mercy on us. He made us come up here. You are who you are. God is with you. Will you please come down there and have a conversation with her? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Moses is fixed to do the same speech and an angel of the Lord intervened and said, go down there and talk to him and don't fear. And so he does. And so Elijah goes and has a, has a conversation with the king in his bed. And he, guess what his message was? You're going to die here. <laughs> you better get ready. Now I'm going to go back to the mountain. <laughs> See you. <laughs> That's it. The end. You're like, what in the world is that all about? Well, I think it's about a lot. You, which team are you on? God's team? Or are you consulting with earthly uh, authorities and mediums to get your answers? I mean, there's a lot of, of good quality storylines in here. But God's team wins. Humility is a positive thing. But the reason I brought it up is because I know that's where these disciples, they had heard this. Is this the spirit of Elijah? And they're still thinking fireballs on people. If they, they haven't understood completely the message of Jesus becoming broken and weak as a path to Start victory. Put a little fear in their heart. It's a preview to why he, Jesus announced that he was going to have to die. But they're still not getting it because he does it three times in the next two chapters. He keeps going back to, I'm going to have to die because they're thinking fireballs. 
I mean, it's a very unusual story, and now we looked at the origin of where they got it all, from. And the all the of rest love. of the Gospels, the whole Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he repeats that over and over and over. Once it's yeah. introduced, Matthew chapter 16, Mark about 9 or 10 in that. But well, that's what, why. Because really in life, look, would it be more fun in life to be a disciple of Jesus and people cross you and you just say, fireballs! Well, you know, that's every human being, the movie spirit in us, we we would like to have that kind of power and and say, don't mess with me, because that's just our earthly kingdom mindset. But in the end, that was that was not Jesus. You know who the plan. disciples, the just James and John, their favorite singer was Pitbull, Fireball. All right, we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Well, this is uh, to be continued. To yeah. be continued, because I've got some definite things to say about Elijah. So if you want to follow us over into overtime, hear a little bit more about that. Uh, BlazeTV.com slash Unashamed is where we'll be. See you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.